London, this country's fair city. But do you know what's always bugged me about it? Those damn werewolves that prowl the streets of London at night. I'm kidding. And as far as I know, there aren't any in London. But I do know a game set there where you might find some. This game brings back memories. Werewolves of London was not only one of the first video games I ever played, but it's my single earliest game memory. From what I vaguely remembered, it was an awesome game back in the day, and it is with some trepidation that I revisit this game to review it. But after making so many game reviews, I feel I'm finally ready to take a hard look at an important piece of my childhood. So, does this game still hold up? The story to this game is interesting. I've watched my fair share of werewolf movies, and normally the main character is bitten by a werewolf and then becomes one on the next full moon. Where this game's mythology differs from mainstream one is that the main playable character, Werewolves of London, was not bitten but cursed to be a werewolf by an aristocracy family. The reason why this curse was placed upon you is unknown, and in a way heightens the atmosphere of the game. But the best thing about this game is how you rid yourself of the curse, and you would never guess how. Silver Bullet? Nope. Taken Monksford? Nope. Killing the progenitor of the werewolf bloodline you now find yourself a part of. <laughs> guess again. How you rid yourself of the curse is by killing the remaining eight members of the family that placed the curse on you in the first place. That's brilliant and puts a great spin on the whole werewolf mythology, and that one aspect alone totally sucked me into this game as a kid. You prowl the streets of London at night looking for the family members that cursed you, and how you know when one is near you is by your werewolf sense. Kind of like a spider sense, but less cooler. So when you're near a family member, a cross starts to blink, and the faster it blinks, the closer you are to them. You can only take out each of these family members when you're a werewolf. And if you're in human form, well, you have to wait. I never minded that, as it added to the overall experience, and the feeling of following these family members and knowing that once you've turned, they've had it, kind of brings out the inner stalker in you. The benefit to being in human form is you don't freak out anyone, and this allows you to search for family members or go after items to aid you in your unholy quest. One of the first things I did right at the beginning of this game was grab the file and headed straight for Hyde Park. Right at the uh, middle bottom of the park is the jail cell and you can break in using the file. I know it's strange to break into a jail cell, but there is a good reason for doing this. Once you've broken in, leave the file in the cell and if you get arrested again by one of the police officers carrying keys, you can break out of jail or just be lazy and wait for the sunrise. But that's a risky thing to do if you were just shot before being arrested as the last thing you want to be is stuck in jail bleeding and hoping night turns to day before you bleed to death. A bandage right about now would be handy as they stop you from bleeding and in a pinch are lifesavers as long as you don't have the police chasing you. Because if you get shot again, you're right back to where you started, bleeding to death again. And that's why having the file is handy as you can escape the jail cell and grab a nearby passerby in the park for a quick meal to top up your blood bag. But if you haven't used the bandage before doing that, you'll still continue to lose blood. You can find at least one bandage in Hyde Park and loads in the underground, and one in the secret area that you can only find by using the manhole opener and the flashlight, but good luck finding it. Also, one tip, the secret area is where you find the last family member. The flashlight can be useful for seeing your way in the underground. And about the underground, you need money to get past the gate, which you find the old victim. But you can always just jump the gate in human or werewolf form, so needing money to get past the gate is kind of a pointless feature of the game. I've given you a good idea of how the game works, so back to the hunt. Where this game gets interesting is how it reacts to, like every time you find and kill a family member, the next one then becomes more harder to find, and with each new victim, the presence of Scotland Yard's finest increases. You can't help drawing attention from killing family members as there's a point of the whole game. So in the process of doing that, if you encounter the police, you can either run from them or eat them. Mmm, nice. So chances are, if you attacked the police or ran away from them, you most likely took some damage unless you were able to dodge their bullets. 
And if you didn't, you now had to regain your health and the only way to do that is to eat some people. The problem with eating people is it yet again draws attention and you don't want that as it makes this game harder. But if you have your back to the wall and you have no choice but to kill to survive, sorry, no hard feelings. The sound effect of you munching on your victims is a nice touch. Eating people to survive is a necessary evil, but it has a knock-on effect of scaring all the people so you end up with less people to munch on and more police after you. One criticism with the increased police force is the super, super slowdown. Any more than two or three characters, you start to notice the game dropping frames. Where this becomes most noticeable is with the police's maximum possible presence. I guess any more than eight characters is just too much for the Amstrad's hardware to take. Even with the slowdown, this is still a very playable game, and you have to consider why there is slowdown in the first place. This game was trying to push the hardware by having as many things happen on the screen as possible. The only other game I know on the Amstrad to have more than a few characters on screen without any slowdown was Lemmings. The characters do like definition, but at least you know what they're meant to represent, and for a game this old, you can't hold it against it. I love the main character's constant facial expression as you can see his lips moving up and down almost in a kind of um num 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 num. <laughs> Makes me laugh every time. The world this werewolf inhabits is a pretty good looking one. While I don't find Hyde Park that interesting to look at, the town areas more to make up for it as you can see so much detail in them and with the cool lighting effect as it changes from night to day really adding to the atmosphere of those locations and the overall game experience. And it wouldn't be a complete game without some decent music. As expected with video games of this era on 8-bit computers, you normally don't get much, if anything, in the way of a soundtrack. Luckily with Werewolves of London, we are treated to three fantastic tunes. One for the title screen, and two for in-game. For whatever reason, I never found these tunes repetitive. So if you're into retro video game music, I highly recommend this game's soundtrack. When I was planning this review, I posted about it on my Facebook page, and I got some really great comments. The first was from Sean, aka The Game and Beast. The technical limitations was often a treasure for the imagination. We would invent stories about the games all the times as kids because so much was vague and not clear. Great times indeed. And Raymond said, My mind travelled and made up all kinds of cool stories about this tortured soul who became a beast by night. Originally I had planned to write a bit about what these two guys were talking about, and to be honest, I couldn't have said any better myself, they were spot on. So as they say, if you can't top them, borrow and go out strong. It wouldn't be a complete review without a little history thrown in, and while this game doesn't have much history, what little has is fascinating and worth telling you about. When this game was first announced, it got a lot of attention for being loosely based on an American wealth in London, and even featured on the cover of your Sinclair magazine issue 23 in 1987. And the most obvious thing about this game is it has the same name as the song by Warren Zovon. Could this design's Werewolves of London deliver on the hype when this was set to be released by the UK division of Alerosoft as a full price game? Now, this is where things get confusing. This game was delayed for some time as the UK Alerosoft division was closed down and it wasn't until 1989 when Mastertronic stepped in and released Werewolves of London as a budget title with the Amstrad version on one side and the Spectrum on the other side with a separate cassette for the C64 one. Now, according to some sites on the internet, this was apparently released back in 1987, but only for the Amstrad. And this review from Advanced Computer Entertainment back in 1987 confirms it. Let's leave the confusion of when this game came out. How did it fare? Well, reviews were mixed. Computing with the Amstrad only gave this a 61%. Your Sinclair said this is a curious failure in many ways as the ideas behind it were so good. They claimed in the review the game was full of bugs and was unfinished. It didn't help that they must have felt burnt when they devoted a full front page and a favourable article for a game that was in the end delayed on the spectrum for two years. Game Machine gave it a 75% and said Wales of London is a nicely constructed, humorous and pleasant release from Viz Designs. Ace rewarded it with 573 out of 1000. And finally C plus VG given it straight 7s across the board. From most of the reviews I've read, this game seems to get average to slightly above average scores. And what about this game's legacy? Unfortunately, it's... 
it doesn't really have one and it's been pretty much forgotten which is a huge shame I can understand why it has been forgotten as it's not really an accessible experience now for people who didn't play this game all them years ago and then something occurred to me this game needs a retro remake hell the movie it's loosely based on is getting one even though I don't think it needs it as it's still a brilliant movie with some of the best non-digital effects ever seen and it's still an accessible experience to new fans of cinema but this game on the other hand why not remake it it would help to open up this closed game experience to new gamers and at the same time preserve this game's legacy so it doesn't get forgotten so what would a werewolves of london retro remake look like well someone made a concept image on pixeljoint.com showing what a possible retro revamp could be and it looked amazing I'm calling out to everyone who's watching this review, we need a Wales of London retro remake. So my final thoughts, I can't really give this the thumbs up or the thumbs down as it just wouldn't be fair to this game. If you played this all them years ago and are now watching this review, you and I know it's a brilliant game, but for people watching who haven't, especially the younger retro gamers, I just don't know how you would take to this game. So if watching this review has sparked your interest and you want to give it a try, Go in with an open mind, low expectation, and you might get a kick out of it. Thank you for watching, and happy hunting!